Vincent is a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist with the Swedish Ambulatory Behavioral Health System. She went to medical school at University of Michigan and then University of Washington for uh, psychiatry residency and child and adolescent fellowships. So uh, two, 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 two members of the Big Ten, it turns out, <laughs> uh, going forward. So uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Jorgensen. And thank you very, very much for being here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I feel so fancy now. Um, so uh, good morning and welcome. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I think Sarah, yep. Sarah indicated we're good. good. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect, perfect. Um, so I am really excited that actually there was interest in this topic and um, I was asked to come uh, talk about updates in anxiety and depression and it really pushed me to do a deeper dive in the research and I'm excited to share what I found today. Um, I may have been overly ambitious in my slide deck um, so we will see what we get through. It's going to be a little bit of a mix of old and new stuff. Um, and I think Sarah's going to help me uh, if there's questions in the chat as we go, but otherwise I'll try to save some time at the end. Okay, let's see. Next slide. Uh, I have no disclosures to report. Here are our learning objectives for this morning. So over the next uh, 50 minutes or so, um, we're going to first look at identifying measures to screen for youth anxiety and depression and then measures to track response to treatment. So this is what we call measurement based care. We'll cover this topic. And then my next goal is to help increase uh, provider comfort in providing brief counseling and safety planning. And finally, we're going to cover risk benefits of social media and the certain Surgeon General's warning. Um, so that's my new thing. So anything with a star is what I would consider uh, new and uh, hopefully catch your attention that way. The top, uh, the way my kind of slides are working is we'll, we'll start with assessment, we'll move on to treatment, and then we'll move finally to the social media new research piece. First, let's just take a quick look at the epidemiology of anxiety and depression. Um, starting with anxiety, I mean, it is very common, as you guys know, um, up to one in three youth actually might have an anxiety disorder. The age of onset is variable. I know we're kind of focused on teen stuff today, but um, certainly this anxiety disorders can present earlier and often do present earlier. There's many flavors of anxiety um, that kind of evolve as kids get older. Um, GAD is probably the most comorbid with major depression, and so there's going to be a lot of overlap um, in symptomology and presentations between these two. When we look at depressive disorders, I was just updating myself that the epidemiology used to suggest like one in 15 to one in 20, but more recently it's we're looking at one in 10 teens um, will, will have at some point had an episode of depression. Um, mainly we're thinking post puberty or teen, um, teen years for age of onset. Females, non-binary people tend to be more than males. And then there's the morbidity of the actual depressive episode, but um, there's some also newer research about kind of longer term outcomes, um, which point to lower educational attainment, unemployment, early parenthood, and of course we have the increased suicide risk. So these were all associated with an episode of depression in adolescence. Um, and then risk of relapse increases with each uh, subsequent ep episode, so. Oh my gosh. Okay, is is there a teen mental health crisis? I will let you decide. Um, but let's let's look at some of the data. Um, I I always really like looking at the youth risk behavior survey. So that that's the U.S. survey of uh, high school students. This is the 2021 data, 
And really, the trends were not so good, um, essentially worsening mental health across all groups and uh, highlighting particularly increased suicidal ideation and behavior. When we look at the CDC data um, on suicide, um, things are also looking not so good. So if we compare from 2000 to 2021, we're looking at a 52% increase um, in death by suicide. It is the second leading cause of death for youth 10 to 24. Um, the highest risk group in, in terms of race is um, Native American, Alaskan, Inuit. Higher risk as well um, in gender minority, sexual minority populations. Um, males greater than females, generally speaking, and still that um, probably what you may remember is females are more likely to attempt, males are more likely to end their life by suicide. Um, and the fastest rising risk that was observed was in black youth. So I just wanted to highlight a few of these things. Um, this, is, um, this is a slide looking at one of the questions in the youth um, risk behavior survey which asked, um, it, it essentially asked high school students how, um, if they had persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness in the past year. Um, and I find uh, these numbers particularly uh, uh, unfortunate. Um, so it, it, I don't know if you can totally see, but females are above 50%. Uh, males are hanging out uh, closer to 30 percent, at least in 2021. And th this is compared to an average of 28 percent in 2011. Um, so when we combine those two numbers, 42 percent of high school students reported feeling persistently um, sad or hopeless in 2021. Um, assuming you're all on board and agree that there is a problem with teen mental health, um, it got me to thinking, and I know a lot of other people have been thinking about this, about what the unique stressors for this generation um, might be. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few. If other people have ideas, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, I'm always open to. But um, of course, the first one was COVID pandemic. But, but interestingly, the trends for worsening mental health were even before then. Um, but we know COVID didn't, probably didn't do us any favors with, you know, the disrupted educational trajectory, social emotional impact, and um, and we're in the studies on COVID are still kind of forthcoming about the full impact that we're seeing. And then the second piece is the role of technology is I think one big difference in this generation. We've got earlier cell phone ownership, increased time spent online cyberbullying and just, I mean, just, I guess, embarrassing information that can exist online. And then we also have increased access to all things news. Um, news travels much faster. Um, too many distractions. You know, it's always a question. Too many uh, dopamine hits. I'm not sure. School shootings are another big consideration for this generation. Racially motivated viol violence is something that's I think we're appreciating more. Um, climate change, opioid epidemic, and uh, finally, I, I listed some what I would consider unhelpful narratives around mental health, and I think um, this generation has an interesting relationship with mental health where. Um, Sometimes I get worried that there's a little over identification with uh, being sick or not mentally well. But anyway, one of the hashtags like bed rotting and treat yourself. I mean, anyway, I, I don't mind treat yourself all the time, but sometimes it's a little excessive. OK. So the good news is you guys are here and we can definitely be part of the solution. I, I really do think primary care um, Providers are uniquely positioned to help address kind of the teen mental health crisis um, with that longitudinal relationship and the building of trust with families.
moving on to looking at kind of more clinical features of um, anxiety and depression. So th there are definitely some similarities, but I wanted to highlight a few differences as well. Let's start with anxiety. The, the first thing I think about is, um, and I think a lot of these kids are probably coming to see you first, but um, it's definitely a, a somatic focus, somatic complaints, particularly anything in the midline is um, more suggestive of an anxiety disorder versus like something more laterally focused. So I think classic kind of anxiety somatic complaints would be more along the lines of stomach aches, headaches, particularly if they're like conveniently located like right before school starts and then resolve on the weekends. There's certainly some, you know, flavor that that might be an anxiety disorder. Um, worries or stress. Uh, recently, I had a family tell me like, talk about how their kid couldn't go to sleep for hours before bedtime, but but they weren't worried. They had the scaries. And I'm like, okay, well, worries maybe is now like an old fashioned term or something that people don't want to identify with. But um, so people may, might use different language to talk about this. Um, oppositional irritable mood, I think, is an interesting part of anxiety disorders. Um, anxious parents, uh, I, that's always a good sign that you're onto something if there's an anxious parent. Um, and really, the distinguishing factor is between normative anxiety is this kind of maladaptive coping, which is a lot of avoidance, reassurance, rituals, accommodation from parents. Now, let's compare to clinical features of depression. And again, we can have overlap between these two and they can be comorbid. But more what I'm thinking we're seeing with kind of a depressive picture is that low irritable mood, the kid that's a motivated, that's stop turning in homework assignments that's very self-critical, that doesn't like anything about themselves, that of course has concentration problems like most teens do these days. They're sleeping too much. Um, they may have thoughts of wanting to die. And isolation definitely from family is, um, is common. And then, you know, kind of like becoming more reclusive in their rooms. And then definitely a later stage would be kind of isolating from friends. So that would be more concerning. What is the difference? I get this question all the time, all the time from families to some degree. So I thought I would just highlight a few things about kind of anxiety is a normal emotion. So let's uh, let's get that out there. But but there is like some differences between what makes an anxiety disorder and what um, is just kind of a more typical experience of anxiety. So most normative anxiety is is related to a specific stressor, um, like. For me, it's probably like related to public speaking. Fortunately, this will only last as long as this talk is uh, existing. Um, it's proportional to the stressor. It's realistic. It responds to reassurance. So again, like all, all these things, we think of anxiety as a normative emotion um, if these factors are present. When I'm thinking about more pathological anxiety, it's anxiety out of the blue. It's bigger than what I would expect. It's unrealistic. Um, and it lasts for a long time, even after the stressor has resolved. Um, so it's essentially it's hard to control, does not respond to reassurance or requires frequent reassurance. Um, and then there's this key aspect of avoidance um, of whatever it is that's anxiety provoking. And and this is all in the context of everything is safe. There's not like a dangerous, like an area of danger per se in any of these um, examples. So. so now we get to the point of uh, screening, which is so critical, especially in primary care. Um, I think it's so important if we want to try to change trajectory of the mental health landscape um, to identify kids at risk. They may present to you, I suppose, with their own self-diagnosis as well. But um, but without screening, a lot of kids with depression and anxiety are probably being missed in primary care. So both American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Preventative Services Task recommend screening, at least for depression, for 12 and up. 
I think you guys now have a flavor for what anxiety disorders look like, so definitely permission to screen at any point for those if the symptoms arise. These are the screening tools that that I typically think of um, and are also really helpful for diagnosis. Um, so my favorites are definitely um, for teens are definitely generalized or the GAD7 and the PHQ9. They conveniently also are wonderful for tracking symptoms. Um, if you wanted a more detailed understanding of anxiety disorders, the SCARED um, is good and it's an EPIC. Um, the, if you wanted a better understanding of uh, younger kids with depression, there's the SMFQ. And then when I think about suicide risk screening, the Columbia stands out because that's at least what's in EPIC. So that's what I use with regularity every day. Um, but there is a cool tool from NIMH called the Ask Suicide Screening Question. So that's just another resource that I thought I'd share with everyone. Oh, <laughs> yeah, this this just highlights my love of the PHQ-9 and the G87. Um, the PHQ-9A is technically the one that's been validated for adolescents and has like slightly different wording, but it's very similar to the PHQ-9. So this is what we're going to cover when we, we talk about measurement-based care a little later in the talk. Let, let's just pause for a second and think about differential diagnosis when a teen's coming to you with kind of maybe a mixture of not going to school or doing poorly at school, sleeping more, um, kind of in a funk. Parents are worried and they're on their case. Um, so what I typically think about, I mean, this is definitely where screening is helpful, but I, I, I mean, I really do think about typical development as part of our differential diagnosis and not over pathologizing potentially normative emotional experiences. Um, trauma is another big one to think about. Um, not not even just abuse or bullies or other things, but but even trauma within the family, like if there's housing insecurity or food insecurity. Um, all the psychiatric disorders have a little bit of overlap, so um, that's the fun part that I probably like to think about more than you do. Um, but you know, like ADHD, OCD, PTSD, all these are kind of more different flavors of anxiety with ADHD. Since everyone seems to think they have it, I think more of an organizational problem versus inattention due to potentially anxiety or depression. Bipolar, hard to tease out. Autism, also hard to tease out if it's never been diagnosed before as in a teenager, but I think strong social skills deficits. Eating disorders, substance use disorder. So all of these things are going to contribute to maybe why things aren't working too and things to think about if. Um, if things aren't working with your treatment. Medic, medically, I do think, um, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking like thyroid, iron, any nutritional deficiencies, particularly um, thinking about kind of sunlight, vitamin D with our Seattle area climate. Um, obstructive sleep apnea has emerged as a real potential mimic of a lot of psychiatric conditions. Med side effects like prednisone, man, that those will give you side effects. So. Okay, so whenever there's a positive screening for depression, I mean, assessing for safety, oh, geez, that's exciting, um, is, is going to be important and it, really critical, I think, to try to meet with the teen individually. Um, and then we're going to talk more about asking about suicide and self-harm directly. I'm just going to highlight uh, some of the risk factors, acute risk factors that um, I think are important to think about as you're as you're assessing for safety. So the biggest one is a prior suicide attempt. And the more recent that is, probably the bigger the risk. Um, Non-suicidal self-injury is an independent risk factor um, for death by suicide. And then we're also thinking like acute life changes, life stressors, active substance use, hopelessness. And then finally, this is kind of unique for um, teenagers, but exposure to suicide in media or real life is, is a risk factor. Teens are definitely more susceptible 
to knowing what's going on in their um, in their sphere. So with suicide risk assessment, I'm guessing this is not kind of in your comfort zone, so I'll be getting you a little bit out of your comfort zone, but I, I, I want to just approach it kind of hopefully thoughtfully and methodically. Um, but my general technique is to start broad and then to go more narrow. So have you ever wished you were not alive? Um, have you ever thought about killing yourself? Have you ever tried to kill yourself? Um, and and really uh, kind of th this, I think old, maybe old fashioned idea that they're, um, that asking about suicide is gonna implant the thought. Um, we we know now that, that that's not true. And um, I think there's a lot of studies really now that appreciate how asking directly is really where we're gonna get the information. If you have the Columbia in Epic, it, it'll prompt you if there's a problem, uh, you know, if there's a positive PHQ-9, that question nine sig usually is what signals us that there's a suicidal thought. And then I also think about getting specific about today um like where are things at today are you having a plan are you thinking about killing yourself right now what's keeping you alive um those are the things that i want everyone to be thinking about when we're thinking about suicide risk oh this is the ask um ask suicide screening tool it's it's a cool one um i i i don't know if you guys have it but there's a supplemental information um sheet that i created with a list of like online therapy options and book options and website options and crisis line information so and this is on there so you want to check it out for later okay oh and this uh, this was actually really uh an interesting thing that i i learned in creating this talk but um Let's just talk for a second about like what a typical duration of a suicidal crisis is, because I think it sheds some light on why we do what we do to prevent suicide. But essentially, suicide risk fluctuates over time, especially if somebody has suicidal thoughts. Um, and this was an interesting study that looked at 153 survivors of near lethal suicide attempts, ages from uh, 13 to 34, and and they asked how much time passed when you decided to complete suicide and when you attempted suicide. Any guesses? Okay, uh, a, a quarter were, were less than five minutes. I mean, this really just speaks to the impulsivity. Another quarter were between five to 19 minutes. The, this last quarter was like between 20 and 60 minutes. And then finally, kind of in the minority, we have greater than two hours for, and then 13% greater than one day. I mean, so this just to me highlights how impulsive suicide attempts typically are. And it also highlights that we can potentially do something about them. Um, so this is really where I, I, I hammer home the restricting access to means. So if we're just looking at a potentially five to 20 minute window of time where there's, you know, that acute um, suicidal ideation is is washing over a person. Um, yeah, let's let's make sure everything is harder to access. There isn't anything that's easy to access. Um, yeah. OK, so here's my scripting or what I say <laughs> you can you can use it or not, but um but some ideas for, for you when you do encounter when suicidal ideation is present. Um, what, what I say is, you know, your safety is my first priority. I care about you. I don't want you to hurt yourself. I'm gonna walk us through a safety plan to help keep you alive. So really the, um, the latest kind of data on suicide prevention is making a safety plan is one of our more effective tools. I, I like to do it collaboratively with parent if possible unless the kid really hates their parents but um then it's usually not very effective but but if we can get both parties on board that's always helpful and then if the kid discloses suicidal thoughts with a plan um i say you know this is uh, this is where we need to talk to your parents about keeping your environment as safe as possible or caregivers or whoever they live with um 
So that's usually where I'll meet with a parent or caregiver separately. You know, this is where I definitely don't want to implant additional ideas about planning. Um, but I, I tell parents, you know, this is where you do like you did when you had a toddler. Essentially, you lock things up. Um, so all, especially guns, I mean, I highlight, you know, if there are guns, I'm like, how do we keep them safe? I respect that, you know, everyone's in an ideal world. I'd love it if I didn't have to ask that question, but um, how do we keep things more safe in the home and just really partnering with hopefully that parent to to lock things up, medication, sharps. I mean, more difficultly, anything strangulation as well, but um, that's a little bit trickier. I like to provide crisis line information and handouts on safety planning and suicide prevention when when there is suicidal ideation. And then I, when you kind of, when you have suicidal ideation, I I mean in my mind it's kind of an automatic referral to therapy um, and and maybe a medicine depending on kind of what the clinical picture is. When you're thinking about referral for like a higher level level of care, and I, I'm really thinking about the ER or inpatient psych is what I'm thinking of. Um, and again, like trust your instincts. Like if you really feel like, you know, the kid and the parent are not able to be safe um, at home, um, that's what you got to do. But I, I think it's interesting that a real key point is that psychiatric hospitalization actually hasn't been shown to reduce suicide risk overall. Um, you know, it, it might help like reduce that impulsive urges, but um, so I and, and I think there are some unique risks with being around other kids that have suicidal thoughts um, and behaviors. But I would think about it if there is a plan, if the parent or family member is not engaged in safety planning with you, and if there potentially is an, a recent suicide attempt or um, or active substance use, because all of these things are pretty put the kid in higher stressors. So you're going to see on this Columbia, it'll highlight as high risk but if this particular situation. This is uh, one way you can word it. I don't know if if you like uh, analogies or not, um, but uh, I think of a safety plan as like a fire drill. You know, schools use these um, for emergencies with fires. We all know what to do. Everyone's on the same page. So having a plan of action helps people act quickly in an emergency. So a safety plan really can help you cope with suicidal thoughts now or in the future. Um, so, okay, how's my timing? Okay, we'll move on to treatment and um, I'll make sure I have time for the social media piece too. Okay, these are the really big studies in child psychiatry. These are our like lovely randomized control trials um, that essentially have a similar message. So the, the big anxiety one, compared sertraline to therapy to combination to placebo and essentially everyone did better if they got combination or if they got one of the treatment arms but combination was 80 percent cbt 59 sertraline 55 so anyway good data to know similar situation with um tads which is our depression study fluoxetine versus cbt versus combo versus placebo. So everyone's looking better at 12 weeks with a combination, but fluoxetine and, and CBT are also effective. I think the key point with depression is that um, suicidal ideation decreased with treatment, but less so with fluoxetine. So if we add therapy, that enhances the safety of our treatment. Here's the scoop for anxiety and depression. Um, Treatment really depends on severity of symptoms. So um, again, very similar, but for mild, I think brief counseling, CBT, moderate, we're thinking of maybe floating in an SSRI, and then severe is, is definitely usually combination treatment unless there's a contraindication. So what do you do when you're talking about brief counseling for anxiety? I think the first thing is just sharing the results of your screening tools um, and sharing concerns. Like I think this, um, I'm worried that you have an anxiety disorder. And this is where you can provide all the different handouts. Um, I think of the um, 
pandemic is at least highlighting the ability for us to do things more effectively online. So there's a lot of online resources. There's a lot of modules online. I put these in the supplemental information form for you guys. And generally speaking, if you want some key take homes about anxiety disorders, we want kids and their parents to focus on coping ahead versus avoiding. For parents, I say, heavy focus on rewarding brave behavior. Um, parents can be a really key part of the treatment. Oh my gosh, and please try to avoid online school. That's probably our worst case scenario, but um, sometimes it happens. Oh, okay. For depression, again, like similar, uh, similarly review results of screening, share your concerns, um, offer support and validation. Like it sounds like things are really hard right now. Um, I like to float in. These are some just basic ideas to help with what I would call mood hygiene. Um, so exercise, I'm sure as physicians and other um, providers, you guys are all familiar with floating exercise as a recommendation. Um, and it really can be effective for depression. Doing is always better than not doing when it comes to depression. So your bed is not the place you want to be when you're depressed. So avoiding bedtime and daytime hours. I've had a lot, a lot of good luck with this. Um, scheduling pleasant events. Um, thinking eventually I'm going to plant a seed thinking about the role of technology and social media in their presentation may also be helpful. If Nothing else happens. I mean, you can also have the kid just track their mood over the next month. Like, hey, let's be a detective. You tell me what brings your mood up and what brings your mood down. Track it twice a day and tell me what you think. And then we have all the wonderful psychoeducational handouts, websites, books, um, workbooks even, um, particularly for teens that are against therapy. And I think one of the key points that we're learning as well with kind of management of depression and anxiety in primary care is it just, you know, is especially for depression, following up, I care, I want to see you again. Um, it's important. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I think I may have hammered this home, but um, if suicidal ideation is present, like step number one is definitely creating a, a safety plan. I mean, assessing risk level, but creating a safety plan in itself can be a treatment. And any, um, you know, physicians and advanced practitioners can all do this, but um, but some people can do this, you know, in the clinic setting if, if they have some training. Um, meet with parents if possible, restrict access to means. That's our second biggest, well, probably one of our key big things in suicide prevention. My general advice to, to parents, because they always ask, um, you know, well, how do I act? And I'm like, well, to try to keep it a little low key, you know, pick your battles, but try to maintain the structure. It's not like we go into full hiber hibernation mode and nobody leaves the house per se. But like if we can, like try to keep the structure in place, but just, you know, don't don't try to pick a fight. Um referral to therapy, crisis line numbers, consider SSRI. Um, and then that scheduling close follow-up, but even if it's a nurse call in a couple weeks to check in with families, I think all of these things are really key for managing suicide risk. Apparently, I've said this before. I'm just I just felt the need to put this in a separate slide, but um, but safety planning is it really an evidence-based treatment tool? Sometimes it feels um, um I don't know, like, like maybe it isn't, but um, but really the data point to it really being helpful as as long as we can collaboratively make one with the teen and the parent. And since we know suicidal duration of suicidal crises are are, are usually on the less than one hour range, this can help kids cope in the moment. Here is kind of my sample safety plan, but um, you know, in the in Epic, there is a, a safety plan and it prompts you for these things. So definitely just use that protocol. Um, I like to involve parents because I think it gives them some clues about you know why their kid might be acting the way they are. Um, but I look at warning signs, what kids can do to cope, what family can do to help them cope, how to make the environment safe, who to call, crisis lines. And, uh, you know, ideally, we'd be highlighting reasons for living as well. What keeps you going? 
Okay. When therapists are hard to find, I feel like now we have, um, we have so many more online resources that make it a little bit easier to access care. Of course, not all teens want to do things online. So then we're a little bit stuck again, but, um, but there really are some uh, impressive online supports. Um, so I, I put this list out um, and there's more in that handout about specific Washington state options. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a cool thing. I think about how the pandemic evolved for us. There's apps, there's more online therapy, there's more online resources, there's good old fashioned workbooks. Um, so no excuses to not do something. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Psycho Farm. I mean, nothing, <laughs> Depressingly, there's not a lot that's new in the psychopharm world. I guess vortioxetine was in, uh, approved as non-inferior to fluoxetine, but uh, if you're if you're already going to that level, I mean, we might have more problems. Um, like that might definitely be a time to send them over to child psych or something. Fluoxetine. Sertraline, escitalopram, those, those those are the big three for me. And, and this is just a resource, to hopefully, to look at the starting dose and how quickly to increase it. Um, typical side effects is what I like to cover. Um, I say, essentially, you know, SSRIs are well tolerated. Most people don't have a lot of side effects, but if they do, they typically happen in the first couple weeks to month of treatment. Some common ones might be some upset stomach, headaches, sleep might change. Um, uh, I have to be honest, I don't always mention sexual side effects, but for an older teen, and if I'm talking confidentially, I, I would mention it. Um, and then the rare things that we want to look out for is if you're kind of, if your mood changes in a bad way, we want to know about that. If there's any worsening of suicidal thoughts, we definitely want to know about those things. So I'm like... And typically, if those last two things, uh, well, at least if the last one's happening, we stop the medicine. If activation is happening, we may end up stopping the medicine too, but um, you could also decrease the dose. This is a little bit similar to what I said, but essentially I like people to know that, you know, side effects typically go away with time as and the way we can mitigate them is we just start low and we go slow. Um, and families monitoring mood is super helpful because that allows us to um, track trajectory of symptoms and, and catch if there are any side effects. I do highlight meds do need to be taken daily for them to be effective. Um, and, and they can take, you know, I mean, unfortunately for a lot of families, they can take, you know, four to six weeks to really kick in. So, and my last piece is I like to set super realistic expectations. These are not gonna fix everything, if they work, I would like them to be turning the volume down on either anxiety or depression. Psychopharm um, for anxiety, I start with sertraline or fluoxetine, and I start at typically like a half dose if they're really anxious and somatic, and there's liquid formulations out there. So for those no pill swallowers, that there, there you go. Um, I'm going to keep moving on with respect to time because I want to spend at least 10 minutes with the social uh, media piece. But flu fluoxetine is really number one for depressive disorders. That's, I guess, I will just leave it at that. And if one SSRI doesn't work, I typically move to a different SSRI. Third line would be more of an SNRI like venlafaxine or duloxetine or Welbutrin. Avoiding paroxetine, there's now more data about how that's probably our biggest risk for worsening depression of all the SSRIs. So measurement-based care, yes. Um, this, I don't know why this didn't get more press, but I mean, this was a, at least there was a study for adolescent depression with measurement-based care. Actually, some of the psychologists from Children's were the lead authors on this study, but um, essentially, measurement-based care can improve both response and remission rates for um, youth depression. What the heck is it? Um, it's it's really not that complicated. I mean, I know it does add some logistics to your clinic flow, but um, 
The first step is collecting data um, with, with a patient reported measure. So this could be PHQ-9, G87. Those are the two that I use most frequently. And then once your MA or whoever collects that data, you look at it, um, you know, potentially before you see the patient. And then, you know, as you're talking to them, you share feedback about, hey, I noticed your numbers are going up or down, or this number is going up or down. And then it allows you to act more um, specifically on um, on what's what's you know what's the problem or what what kind of signal are we seeing? Are we seeing improvement? In which case, you know, we keep going, or do we need to adjust things? Do we need to make a dose adjustment? Like it just really enhances, I think, that nuance in our medication management, as well as like identifying behavioral strategies that um, we should focus on, like you know, the kids in bed all day, that sort of thing. Okay, and when things aren't working, make sure you're tracking symptoms to really understand trends. Um, check in with parents. This is my med management kind of piece. You know, when things really aren't working, I'm like, well, did I get the diagnosis wrong? Is there an occult eating disorder or substance use disorder? Is there bullying? Is what the heck is going on? I mean, sometimes meds don't work. So, I mean, definitely that's a possibility. But um, but if all treatment doesn't seem to be working, that's that's what I think about. Hopefully quality of therapy is good. Screen time, social media. Let's check in about that. And parental mental health, as you guys know, everything trickles down with parents if they're having problems. Um, and then this is my slide that I'll let you guys look at for stabilization. It's essentially, I, I like treatment to continue for six to 12 months once things are stable. Ideally, a taper of medicines. I mean, I realize most teenagers kind of abruptly stop them, but um, ideally a taper is nice. And then we know that the longer or the more frequent episodes you've had, the more likely you are to relapse. So that might be worth staying on medicines longer if they're helpful. Okay, yay. Now we're moving on to the new, the new and exciting. So you guys know this about social media, but oh my gosh, huge rapid changes. 95% is the latest number that, you know, essentially, so you're in the minority if you're not using social media. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to highlight is social media platforms really were designed to maximize user engagement. <laughs> They were not designed with any health or safety ideas about teens and the teen brain. So the top flat platforms, and these are always changing, so I always have to you know, check in with teens about what's cool these days, but YouTube, um, take, which I actually didn't think of as social media, but um, it, I guess it qualifies. TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram. Finally, I, I apparently can never really successfully convey this to teens, but there, there is a lot of academic dysfunction tied to just having a smartphone a, in your presence. So when I think social media versus like the adolescent brain, I th I'm thinking like, well, what is normative adolescent brain development? I mean, we're thinking risk taking is normative, identity formation is really normative, peer relationships, the emphasis goes from less family to more peers. Oh my gosh, now we throw in this like highly interactive communicative platform that all peers use, that's a recipe for something. So in, um, in May, this is when the Surgeon General came out with the warning about risks of social media. It's it's an I mean if you want to read it it's it's actually a nice little summary of things. So, you know we don't know a ton, but I, I think it highlights a really important trend. Um, it bring and it brings a lot of attention to risk benefits. Um, essentially, social social media can have some positives and negative impact on mental health. The risks they really highlighted into two areas: content risks and problematic use risks which I agree. I mean, those are the two things and uh, more studies. So what the heck are the benefits? Like I'm always asking myself when I'm trying to figure out how to be more compassionate with uh, my patients, but teens really like feeling connected to friends, getting support, meeting new people, exploring interests, creative expression, helpful information. Other, um, I think that more unique considerations is that, you know, there's 
there really is some positive identity affirming content related to race and gender. It's provided a unique platform for people with um, autism spectrum disorders to, to unite and um, forge more community. Uh, the risks, oh, sleep, oh my gosh, yes. Addictive potential, I mean, that that's the other thing we're learning is, you know, not all addiction is uh, substance use. Uh, there's a lot of new research on behavioral addiction, which is emerging. We still don't, uh, you know, that's an emerging field. Online harassment, abuse, exacerbation of eating disorders, body image, unhealthy social comparisons, misinformation, contagion effects. Oh my gosh, it's always interesting with the TikTok ticks. Uh, this this was a survey. A lot of people thought they were either addicted or they saw harmful content. So again, this just highlighted that there's some risks. And and really, like 83% of 11 to 12 year olds have their own cell phone. I was I was impressed. Okay, what what do we do? This is the this is really from the Surgeon General's warning. Um, and, and they had advice for everyone, so that was good. I mean, it's a complex problem. It's going to require a complex solution. Um, and we still don't even exactly know what the problem is. But here was the ideas in terms of um, kind of what to do about the risks. But for policymakers, more focus on data security, age minimums, digital media literacy in schools, more oversight of tech companies. Um, and then for tech companies, this was the Surgeon General's advice was transparency and sharing of relevant data, research advisories, um, platforms maybe like redesigned to focus on health and safety, and then investigating reports of um, harmful content quickly and taking action quick, more quickly so that things don't live out there forever. You probably already counseling people about social media to some degree, but um, this this is, I thought, some helpful things to think about when you're talking to teens. Don't keep anything a secret. Um, don't keep abuse or harassment a secret, and and don't participate in it either. Reach out for help. Create your boundaries, both online and offline. Be cautious about what you share online. Families creating a media plan, creating tech-free zones like no Wi-Fi at night or something along those lines. Encouraging in-person friendships. Modeling. <laughs> this is always the key with parenting. You know. You have to be the model first to, um, to get your kids to change. So you have to be have a healthy relationship with your phone or social media and then reporting any cyberbullying. My last highlight of kind of our more unique uh, research in the field is that, that, that racial disparities definitely exist in mental health, unfortunately. So black youth are underrepresented in, in mental health research studies. We know they're the fastest rising risk of suicide typically less access to care and more likely to drop out of treatment. Um, and this is, this was, anyway, something that I've taken to heart is that, um, also more likely to be misdiagnosed as conduct disorder or psychosis versus ADHD, depression, anxiety, autism. So again, just I like now I'm just trying to be more mindful of when I do think about diagnosis, what what could be actually going on. OK. This is my summary slide. Yay, we made it through. Um, thank you for being here. But uh, essentially, screening tools are great and they help us to track symptoms. Treatment can start in your office. You got this. Um, safety planning is huge if there's suicidal ideation. Measurement based care can help um, be more effective in our treatment outcomes. And social media is complicated, but probably not good in excess, especially for girls. And racial disparities exist for us, especially Black youth and Native youth. So, hey, let me know if there's questions. There weren't any questions in the chat, but if you have any questions, feel free to jump off mute and ask. I don't have a question. This is Mark Fisher. Um, I'm out of state, but I just want to thank you, Dr. Jorgensen and Sarah, for, for helping again. And uh, um, 
have a good day and a good weekend. But uh, I just wanted to, of course, just say thanks. Thanks, Dr. Fisher. Anybody have any questions? All right. Dr. Can Kennedy, you, can did you hear you me? Have... Yep. Okay. Yeah, I just had, I'm sitting here thinking about my 16 and 18 year old sons and relating to a lot of what you're saying. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jorgensen. This is excellent. Sorry to have to come in late. The uh, question I have is about uh, guns. And um, there, there's such an interest in uh, guns these days. I, I, I'm hearing this discussion all around the home. When kids leave the home, they think about getting guns, things like that. We don't have guns in our home for many good reasons. But how do you, how do you deal with that issue? The, the, the interest in having a weapon, the worries about not being protected from things that are all around, and yet, the, at least my desire to not have a weapon in the home, or if it is to have it in a locker, it's in a locker, it's in another locker. No, I, I think you're totally right because uh, you're hitting on ex um, essentially why it's such a complicated thing. Uh, you know, because uh, I think families culturally have different belief systems about guns. And I I think the more we've learned in, in at least mental health is that, you know, telling somebody what to do doesn't usually work well um that i think it's it, i think it's essentially you know or or if anything is going to change it's probably going to be on the policy level but um but if a family you know does have a a gun I, you know i i try to be thoughtful and um understanding and at the same time how do we mitigate safety risks i mean really the if we or if we're thinking purely about safety from suicide um we're thinking everything's got to be locked up if if there's a risk factor there. And um, I know it's complicated with kind of school shootings and threats and stuff. And um, I think, you know, I think a lot of kids are probably confused about, you know, how to how to be safe in this world. Um, so I don't have all the answers, but I, I definitely am with you that um, and unfortunately, the data is really clear about suicide risk and and guns. Yeah, and if if we could, you know, stop boys from watching, you know, Fortnite and playing shooting games all day, I mean, I would love that, but I, I don't think that's ever going to stop per se, but. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jorgensen. This is really fascinating, and I appreciate you doing this so much. Okay. Thank you, guys. Have a great day and weekend. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.